Thank you, Patricia. Today, we're going to be talking about confidentiality. We're going to be talking about ethics. Just really exciting stuff today. Um, let's see. Make sure I can see. Okay, is anybody getting a black box on my screen? It's just the slides, Patricia. Sorry, Michelle, I was catching up on the chat. I do not see a black box on Great. the screen. Yeah, thank you. Uh huh. Okay, so today we're going to talk about survivor privacy. We're going to be talking about our ethical responsibility as advocates through both law, policy, and also through funding sources here in Washington State. So if you are not in Washington State, some of this stuff may not apply. And so um, you can follow up with us later um, to see if you're from a different state. I know Idaho is here. Um, I can probably get you some something from uh, Idaho as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, here are the basics. Uh, we do this work uh, in this way uh, because it's connected to our philo philosophical um, uh, beliefs about the importance of privacy and the safety of survivors. So privacy is an individual choice. Um, it means making choices with your own information so that you have control over your reputation and your engagement with the world. Um, we can understand that survivors of sexual violence, that for survivors of sexual violence, privacy is incredibly important. Um, and part of what's so you know, important about our work is helping to work with them to make sure that they're not just uh, privacy is protected, but they're also able to, again, exercise the choices that were so important from trauma-informed services that we talked about on Monday, right? Which is about choice, it's about safety, it's about trust, right? So privacy uh, fits right in along with all of those pieces from trauma-informed care. And privacy is not about keeping secrets, it's about choosing who knows what, how much, and when, okay? And then confidentiality is a promise. So confidential professionals like advocates promise to respect the privacy choices of the individuals that we're serving so that survivors can get help, they can take risks, they can avoid losing control of their lives. And again, confidentiality is not, not about keeping other people's secrets, it's about respecting other people's choices about who knows what, how much, and when. And the reason I say this is because sometimes we get this, we get in this um, feeling that we're secret keepers or we, we have to hold information, you know, confidential. And I really want us to start shifting that into respecting the choices of survivors um, because it's not about secrets. A lot of survivors want a lot of information out there. They want to tell their story, right? So we are working uh, within these guidelines to keep promises to them and make sure they're the ones that are in control of as much of their lives as possible. And sometimes your information um, at some point is the only thing you have control over, right? Uh, you don't have control over whether or not the police are going to move forward with your case. You don't have control over what a judge, you know, rules. You don't have control over, you know, the if you fit into, you know, the poverty rate that allows you to get TANF, um, you know, all of these different things. So what can you be in control of that is your information? And then privilege um, is a community norm. So communities like ours, like the state of Washington has made a law and many states have these laws that protect uh, the privacy choices of individuals uh, working as confidential professionals and working with survivors. 
So neither of us, survivors or confidential professionals, can be forced to disclose what we have shared with each other. And again, privilege is not about letting people keep secrets. It's about building communities uh, where everyone feels safe to get help without the fear that reaching out for that help uh, will cause harm, will cause further harm. So this is the basics. This is a philosophical kind of approach that we're coming from and just kind of the basics of privacy, confidentiality, and privilege because they're different, but they all kind of overlap again, uh, kind of like in the trauma-informed services section. So why is confidentiality so important? It is the underlying value of trauma-informed and survivor-centered responses to sexual violence, right? We can see where it's fitting in under choice. We can see where it's fitting in under safety, under trust, right? So it increases a survivor's autonomy, uh, uh, which increases their empowerment, right? As they choose when, how, and with whom information is shared. And you'll notice that I keep saying, you know, when, how, and with whom information is shared, uh, because it's not just about sharing or not sharing. It's all the details about how somebody wants their information shared, whether or not we use a fax machine, which I can't imagine anybody does anymore, or we communicate over email. And when we're doing all of these things with survivors or talking to them about that, but we're talking about all the, all the considerations that we might take so that they can make the best choices for them. When someone experiences a sexual assault, they are both in that moment and often throughout um, all kinds of systems, like just systems, right? All through these processes, and they're stripped over a lot of the control they have over their physical, mental, and emotional selves. Again, why it's so important, uh, that why confidentiality is so important. So confidentiality increases the survivor's uh, psychological and physical safety, um, disclosure and reporting can result in threats of harm um, by the perpetrator or by the community at large if that perpetrator is very well loved or respected or has a lot of power within that community. Confidentiality decreases potential personal and societal consequences, such as like discrimination at work, or um, like alienation from family or community, the negative impacts to a survivor's educational career, right? It, confidentiality really increases a survivor's willingness to disclose for the purposes of um, seeking help. So we want to make sure that we're respecting that confident group. We're keeping confidentiality for survivor safety, for that trust and rapport building, and also for positive organizational reputation, right? If people, word of mouth is the best referral source that we have, uh, especially in more marginalized communities, right? That if somebody thinks that we're not going to keep their information private, we're not going to see a lot of people from those communities or those folks that are connected to that person who's said that, right? So we want to make sure we are um, having a good, positive organizational reputation so more people can seek help. We want to show the community that our agency is trustworthy. Okay, a little bit about uh, some federal requirements around confidentiality. Um, victim advocates or um, advocates uh, at community sexual assault programs are required to reasonably protect the confidentiality and privacy of people receiving their services. Um, we cannot, uh, or we shall not, according to the law says we shall not disclose or reveal or release any personally identifying information or individual information without informed, written, and reasonably time-limited consent of the person about whom the information um, is requested, okay? 
So um, this comes from federal requirements, VOCA, which is the Victims of Crime Act, and VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act. The majority of the funding um, that is provided in Washington state to uh, conduct services for survivors comes from these different sources. So even if we didn't have uh, a law in Washington state that said we have to keep this confidential and survivors um, have privilege within our state, we would still have these funding requirements that say we can't give identifying information. So that means, you know, sometimes we have to give uh, information about demographics and things like that. So we wouldn't be able to when we do a grant report and know about action, it's all together. Uh, so nobody can tell, you know, who in the communities um, might be getting services. Which does provide a total washing? Laws here. Sorry, Michelle. 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 Yeah, you're cutting out. Ah. But now, can you hear me now? I heard I heard you say do you hear I heard you say hear me now those three words and that's it. Okay. So the RCW advice out of Washington addresses sexual privilege. The number on that is five point six point six. In the I'm still frozen. Mm -hmm. Can I tell me if I'm still frozen? Mm -hmm. Michelle, can you hear me? It looks like your screen okay. is freezing. Okay. Well, all the chapters keep rolling, so I think it's better now. Is that true? Is my connection better? Michelle, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Okay, yeah, your your screen um, is Still frozen. is like freezing, and then and then it's okay. Um, someone suggested maybe um, exiting and and logging back in. Okay, Let's see, let me check my internet here. Yeah, and thank you all for your patience with this technology. My internet connection seems fine. So oh, good. That's good. You sound good now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know now it's consistent. Oh my goodness. All right. Where'd you lose me on this slide or the slide before? Can we go back to the last is what they're asking. And then Destiny says really a few slides honestly. 
go here. I think so, Michelle. Okay. All right, so why is confidentiality so important? Okay, so it's important for survivor safety, trust and rapport building, and for positive organizational reputation, right? It increases a survivor's likelihood to reach out uh, and ask for help, to make reports if they know that their information isn't gonna be all over the place, right? Because when someone experiences a sexual assault, um, they have to go, you know, just in that moment, they've lost a big choice, right? As we talked about on, on Monday, but also they have to go through all of these systems and processes, sometimes criminal justice systems, where they really have no, no control over what's gonna, what's gonna be happening. So anytime that we can put those choices um, back in the hands of survivors about their information, about their privacy, um, we are um, just increasing their autonomy um, and decreasing just collateral impact, right? Anything that's gonna be um, decreasing uh, their, any like personal or societal uh, consequences um, like discrimination at work and things like that, right? Uh, one of the things that is so prevalent is word of mouth is referrals. We know those are the best ways that we get referrals, especially in, within uh, marginalized communities, right? So we wanna make sure that our, our organization it, reputation is positive, that um, people know that they can trust us. And the best way we do that is by uh, showing that to the current clients that we have. And as word spreads, a lot of times, that helps our positive organizational reputation, as well as just letting survivors know, having information on our websites, things like that about what can be expected, right? That helps establish trust if we say, we're gonna do these things and then we do them, right? Okay. Even if we didn't have laws within Washington state, we still have funding requirements. And these confidentiality requirements come from federal funding sources, the Victims of Crime Act and the Violence Against Women Act. Uh, and it, it um, directs us to keep information protected, to keep information private and confidential, that in our organizations, we, um, ensure that uh, data doesn't get breached um, if we keep electronic files, um, that we don't release information without written, informed, reasonably time-limited uh, consent of the person who is sharing that information. So while, uh, actually, I'll get, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, now we're back. The Revised Code of Washington uh, addresses sexual assault advocate privilege. Um, it is connected to where you work. If you take this training and get a certificate, it's not going to automatically give you advocate privilege. Our statute is connected to the places that you work and who's employed or volunteering for those organizations. So if you're not working for a community sexual assault program, you're not working for uh, a sexual assault, um, Native American, marginalized, uh, uh, child advocacy center, something that you know, is connected to sexual assault funding within this state, you don't necessarily have advocate privilege. It's not about you, it's about the place where you're working. And so to ensure the rights of victims are protected, advocate confidentiality is defined uh, in this particular section of the Revised Code of Washington 5.60.060 in section seven. Privilege is a liability, it's not a mandate. Uh, so we have laws, we have guidelines, we have public policy 
Uh, it really just allows us to hold private information and not be compelled to release it. Um, but it, it, like child abuse reporting, uh, you are if you're a mandatory reporter, you'd be breaking the law if you don't report it and you're supposed to. You're not breaking the law in this way, um, but you do open yourselves up to um, like liability being sued by clients, right? Privilege is a tool for us to help protect the information of clients. Uh, that privilege belongs to the client, it doesn't belong to me, it doesn't belong to the program, it belongs to them, the client. Failure to protect client confidentiality uh, within the context of the law can result in professional liability. So they could sue you, um, you could lose your accreditation status as an organization and or lose funding. Okay. Um, all information, all survivor information that they want to protect, um, our, our programs that we work for are specifically listed in the privilege statute. So it's easy for us to claim additional protection of privilege if we get subpoenaed or if somebody like the police are calling and asking for information. Okay, confidentiality is a dynamic practice. Um, it's not a one-time act that we engage in, but rather a series of acts we engage in over time, um, over the time that we're working with survivors, over the time that we're updating policies and procedures within our organization, where we put our paperwork, it's an everyday thing. So it has to be always uh, kind of at the front of our mind. Um, hmm, if I put this here, will uh, that uh, violate somebody's confidentiality? If I talk to this person, what will that mean? Could I quickly define privilege one more time within the context of the client? Yes, so the privilege belongs to the client, not to me, not to the organization, right? So if, if you're a mandated child abuse reporter and you uh, fail to um, report child abuse in the context of your role, um, you're breaking the law. But this is more professional liability. The law just gives us permission to not share that information. It gives us a legal tool to be able to, if we're subpoenaed, say we're asserting privilege uh, as a legal argument for our organization. belongs to the client, only they can give up their privilege. I can't decide as their advocate uh, what, you know, when to give up their information. It belongs to them. Does that make sense, Ellis? Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yay, another voice. <laughs> Okay, every action that we take as advocates um, or sexual assault program uh, service centers, uh, everything we do to ensure survivors' information is not shared with or disclosed to any outside parties, right? Everything that we do is this dynamic practice of confidentiality. It is the expectation of our relationship with our client and we're legally protected that way. So, Again, the liability is that your client could sue you, you could lose your funding, you could lose your accreditation status if that applies, you're not gonna get arrested. Yes, that's a, a clear, more clear. <laughs> Maintaining confidentiality means that we're regularly looking at how we are protecting our client's information and how we can improve, right? We're moving all the time away from paper and towards um, storing things electronically, right? So we're, this uh, question of confidentiality and privacy is always central to thinking about, do we choose this software? 
what's the password protection process? How many characters do we put in these passwords? Who has access to them? How, how or if we communicate with survivors? Um, so there are lots of examples of actions that we take to maintain confidentiality. And so some of these are like within the context of paperwork and files. We always make it a practice not to document any verbatim statements made by survivors. For one, it's not important. We don't have therapeutic or licensed social worker requirements around keeping um, case notes or anything. So we really don't have, um, a, aside from internal policies you might have at your agency, there's no real place uh, that uh, requires that you keep a lot of information. I would always just keep brief notes, um, kind of the theme or what I provided more than the story that they're telling me, because it's just never going to be important for me to, to write that down. The only time that it might be important is if I was helping somebody prepare their um, victim impact statement or helping them prepare for a protection order where you have to like have a lot of details, um, but all of that stuff gets filed publicly. So um, that's kind of a different scenario. But within my files, there's no reason for me to keep any of that information. I don't need to keep a copy of their police report unless they want me to um, because they're afraid they might lose it. <laughs> Um, but there, you know, there's no reason that we need any of that stuff within our files. We're really just keeping track of what we provide. We never want our records to be portraying a survivor in a negative light in case they do get subpoenaed and we're not able to uh, win our privilege assertion argument within a court where they kind of weigh that it's, you know, more important that they... Um, that, that our, our records are disclosed, which doesn't usually happen. There's nothing interesting within our files. The less stuff we have within there, the less helpful or interesting it's gonna be for somebody to want to subpoena. Sometimes our clients come back and they want to um, have access to their file. They want a copy of their file, um, things like that. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more and what that's like, but that's their information. So they have a right to do that. Um, when we're making phone calls with clients, you know, what are the, what's, what's the way that they want you to call and ask for them if they live in a house with other people to be able to keep them privacy, uh, private? Is it okay for us to leave messages on somebody's voicemail? Um, if a third party calls and asks a survivor, if a survivor is receiving services, um, we never confirm or deny anything because to deny it is a, to also to, um, to say, no, they don't get services here. It's also to violate confidentiality. <laughs> um, so we want to always just to assert our privilege and say, we're not, you know, we're not allowed to, you know, discuss anybody who's receiving services. Um, if you, you know, know this person, maybe you should go back and ask them directly if they're receiving services. And if they need proof of that, then they can ask us for a letter or something like that. I always try to find a way to both kind of be helpful while also not answering any questions. Um, a lot of times we get this from police officers. Maybe if there's a missing person, um, sometimes they'll be calling around. And even if there is a missing person, we're still not allowed to um, disclose information. Uh, we're not allowed to disclose information even beyond somebody's death. Um, there's so much more technology that we're using now <clears throat> that we should all have internal policies at our agencies around working with um, clients over technology, um, either through chat or email or text messages, uh, social media, because it can be really complicated about what becomes a client file. Your whole Facebook account can become a client file if you're messaging back and forth with a client about services. Right. Your cell phone can become a message going back and forth. You want to have a, a policy with your agency about how to delete. And uh, if you're not permitted to use those um, kind of venues for conversation, you want to redirect any client that reaches out to you that way. 
right? This might, you know, I can't guarantee your privacy on this. I can have some people again. Michelle, you're freezing again. Yeah. Did somebody have their hand up? Yes, I did. This is Trish. I was just gonna tell you, I think you were cutting out again. Oh, okay. How am I now? Am I more like a robot or am I more like me? More like you. I wonder okay. if it's the weather, the freezing temperatures. It could be uh, service around my house. It's kind of not the best sometimes. Yeah, it's a wooded area, right? Yeah. <sighs> okay. Where am I? Oh, yes, uh, using social media or technology. Watching the captions is actually really helping me because I can see if if she's typing along with me that I'm not that I'm not frozen. Um, thank you, Brianna, for helping me with that. <laughs> so social media and um, Technology, we try not to use, um, uh, it, it's not a great practice. We never know who's receiving it on the other side. Um, we don't know who the, who the three dots are, right? On a text message and we're waiting for somebody to respond. So we want to have policies within our organizations that guide how we use that, especially because technology and, sur and survivors are really pushing us to do things in a different way. So we want to make sure that we're having these conversations about what I can guarantee and what I can't guarantee about the choices you make when you communicate with me, right? If you send me an email and you put an extra, you know, E in my name, it's not going to get to me, right? If you, you know, change the, the two to a seven in my phone number, you could be texting anybody about these situations, right? So what are the ways that we're going to verify we're talking to the right person? We should have policies around that. Is there, you know, um, a question or a password in a text message conversation where we can verify who somebody is? Um, it's just it's just best to always be talking on the phone. So we send you a message to say, hey, I can call you and we can talk more about this. Um, unless it's just like I'm running late or can we change our appointment or different things like that, right? Um, because anytime that we're involving, especially our personal cell phones, um, those can be subpoenaed. So we want to, and then all of your data that's in there is like, you know, open for discovery. So we just want to make sure that we're only using agency, um, agency cell phones, agency computers, not getting into our personal Facebook accounts and communicating with clients or Anything like that that's going to put us into uh, a situation where um, there's a there's a kind of a cloudy, muddy relationship. If we happen to see a client in public, this happens a lot. Uh, if you live in small communities, um, or there's one church and you go to it, and so does everybody else in town, uh, the grocery store, things like that. Um, we never approach them. We never acknowledge them first. You know, um, we don't know who they're with or who's watching. Sometimes they'll make initial contact. Um, I always let them introduce themselves if I'm with somebody else. Um, and whenever I've been with people, when that's happened, I would say, oh, it's just somebody that I know, you know, and I just try to leave it at that. Um, We want to have a clearly stated approach to working also with other service providers. Um, 
so that they know that they're understanding about how much we can talk about clients with them in other agencies, that they really understand the privilege that we hold um, and that they understand about our release of information processes um, so that we can work together to be able to get those releases. I've had other organizations send me their release, uh, but that doesn't release me, that releases them. So I need a uh, release myself uh, for my own files um, on my side as well. So sometimes it takes a long time to kind of set those things up. It's for the protection of the clients and it's for your liability um, as a professional sexual assault advocate and program. And then finally, I just want to say a few things about debriefing or discussing clients internally within the agency. Like I said, you know, the privilege is, um, it belongs to the client and everybody has access within the agency, generally speaking, to the files, to see who comes in, and we all are working together to kind of protect that. And there's not really a liability within your organization for you to talk with your supervisor, or your coworkers about that client, especially in the ways where we're like, man, I'm really stumped on how to help this person. I can't think of any resources, especially when you're new, right? You need that. You need to be able to debrief and discuss clients internally with your coworkers. So we're just thinking about and wanting to be really conscious about what folks tell us and what we're debriefing and discussing internally so that we can be the most respectful to those folks that we're working with, right? So trying not to give a bunch of details that are not useful to other people within your agency. And you can't, you're not gonna get in trouble. You're not gonna be violating your funding or, um, or any of the promises that you've made by, by working internally with other people. But it's just that additional layer of, of respect for that person's story to not be discussing their story really internally. Sometimes we hear things that are really hard and somebody's like, I really have to talk about the details of this. You know, um, we need to be really clear about why we need to share information. Sometimes it's about vicarious trauma. Sometimes it's about, it's just the worst story that I've heard and I need to talk to somebody about it. Try to frame it about how you feel, how you felt. What does that mean for you? Instead of repeating the details of somebody else's story, right? Because um, they don't know that you're gonna repeat it to other people within the agency, even if you are allowed to. Um, and because your coworkers have their own details of their own clients that they work with and don't need additional ones, right? So let's talk about how, when we're debriefing and discussing clients internally, let us always keep to the front of our minds, like how am I not just repeating the traumatizing details of somebody's story unless they're absolutely necessary for like trying to figure this out? And also how can I be protecting myself and others just from additional traumatizing details? Um, how, how is what I'm talking about helping the client uh, to find more resources and things like that? So always kind of keeping that to the front of our minds. Any questions so far? <coughs> I was just gonna suggest that because this is a lot of dense information. <clears throat> questions about confidentiality, privilege. I mean, we're going to keep talking about it all morning, so. And you can, if you, do, if you have something, a question or something you want to share from your own experience, you can unmute or you can type it in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything that you're afraid of about trying to keep confidentiality, you're in a rural, small town area, anything like that. If you have the question, somebody else does too. Where would be a good place to look for resources when building policies around confidentiality? Well, in your Dropbox folder, there is, um, there should be lots of information in there. Safety net 
a project of the National Network to End Domestic Violence has great stuff around like how to choose a database and um, how to um, considerations to take when you're you know doing digital services. Um, we're gonna have a digital services webinar I think in a few weeks actually too, provided by the National Network to End Domestic Violence um, that um, you all can definitely take, especially if you're members. Everything is is uh, free for you. So uh, feel free to take any of our webinars as well. After the break, I will put in the, in the chat those particular resources for you as well, Susan. Um, they have a whole kind of digital, uh, digital toolkit. <clears throat> okay, and Elizabeth is asking if you use general titles or language like caller or client, is that breaking confidentiality if the details are identifiers? Yes, but if not, no. Correct. Um, yeah, the, uh, we're not, we're trying not to give any personally identifying information. So if we do say, you know, the caller was looking for this. Um, but we also want to think about how their story might be identifying. Um, you know, if it's um, somebody who works at a particular place that only has a few employees and you're talking about, you know, the, the caller works here, then it's kind of identifying, right? Especially if it's like there's six men and one woman that works at this place or so you kind of have to be thinking like that, just about the kind of place that you're uh, just the least amount of identifying information as possible. If you live in a small town and somebody's trans, um, that could be easily identifiable. If you work in a community where um, the majority of people are like white and Hispanic, but the person who, who you're talking about is Cambodian and you're talking about that, that could really um, identify them as well. So you're just thinking about, that's why it's so dynamic. It's like, there's not a good answer to a lot of these questions. It's just, as you're working with people all the time, if I talk about this, will this, you know, personally identify them, right? It's those kind of things. So Elizabeth, you're correct. And also everything takes like just a little bit extra kind of framing, I guess. Does that help? And Melissa has her hand up, Michelle. You bet, Melissa, go ahead. Hi, um, before I started working here, I worked at a local gas station and our community is super small. And we got a new client that came in and they're like, hey, I'm like, hi. And then this weekend I was um, at work, I go around the corner and the first thing I'm like, hey, you know, cause I mean, it was a regular customer that always yeah. was hiding me anyways. And so it was kind of like, I did the whole, like afterwards, I'm like, oh, was I, you know, we both, it was, it wasn't me saying hi. It was kind of like both like, Hey, cause I mean, it was a regular customer that talked to me anyways, everywhere I went. So it was kind of like you second guess yourself. Like, you know, now it's like, you know, <laughs> how, do you, how do you interact with, you know, your, it just, yeah. it's something that I'm learning. So and and working with my coworkers to work through how to, handle that because um, we are a very small community and the gas station I worked at was is one of the main gas stations. So yeah. Oh. That. <laughs> Absolutely. Raymond is is so small, right? In Pacific County. And um yeah I live in Long Beach, so it's even smaller. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So thanks for bringing that scenario up, Melissa, because that's definitely, I think, an issue for so many of us um, around the state. And sometimes it's like, and also if you are, you know, from an immigrant community on top of that, right? Like how being in a small town <clears throat> and then a small community within that, it just becomes really complicated. But I would say, you know, if you're just saying hi to, to someone, you know, in the context of your other job where you're working at the gas station, I think that's fine. Um, because you're working with customers, right? And it's just, if you start to be like, it's really just like if you're out with your family and you run into somebody and then they might be like, well, who is that? Like, I just try never to put myself in those kind of situations. And that's, I wouldn't say hi to somebody if I was like that, unless they said hi first. I'd be like, hello. Sometimes I'd be like, I don't know that person. They just said hi to me. You know, people just saying hi. <laughs> Or sometimes I say, oh yeah, I do recognize that person, but I have no idea from where, you know? 
all that stuff is pretty normal. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it a lot, but it does bring up, it brings up your, just a more heightened awareness when you're in that small town and you already are having these interactions, right? Where you're like, okay, this is going to be, have to be a thing that I'm thinking about a lot. And so that's great. You know, you want it to be something that's at the front of your mind, how you're going to keep confidential information. So thanks for sharing that, Melissa. Anyone else? After we take a break, we're going to talk about the exceptions to confidentiality. And um, Patricia and I are going to do some role playing, and then we'll take another break, and then we'll um, kind of finish up for the day after that. So it's 10 23. Let's come back in about 10 minutes. Um, we have two breaks today, just because, like, like Patricia said, it's really dense um, and kind of hard to listen. So um, let's take a break for about 10 minutes and come back. So 1024. So 1034. Let's come back and then we will talk about the exceptions to confidentiality. Okay. Michelle, you said what time? I was going to put it in the chat to come back. 10, 1034. Okay, welcome back. I put in the chat box a couple of links. Uh, one is a confidentiality toolkit from the National Network to End Domestic Violence. The other one is on um, technology use of organizations. And the other one is the Dropbox link, um, where I do have some of that information uh, attached, as well as tips for working with interpreters is in there as well. Okay, any questions uh, from the break that you brought back with you? Be like, what did you say about that uh, before I start moving forward? It is a lot of information to digest. So we're very happy it is recorded for you. You can visit it at any time. Okay, we're gonna use annotate this morning. Do folks remember what annotate is? You go into your view options, select the little pencil icon or the word that says annotate, and you'll select a stamp. Patricia and I are gonna do some scenarios for you and have you do some crowdsourced answers in a few. So I wanted to remind folks where that is. But that'll be in a couple slides, so. If you don't have that option, you can always just put your answer in the chat. That's also fine. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about exceptions to confidentiality. There are some circumstances under which you can um, disclose confidential information. And so it, it, it can happen under a few uh, circumstances. So one is if the advocate 
um, suspects child abuse or neglect or adults at risk of harm. Um, and that is uh, anyone who's 18 or older who has needs for care or support um, that is that makes them vulnerable, um, that they can't, uh, they have, may have disability or might be of an age where they're needing a lot of care or support um, and they're experiencing abuse or neglect as well. So in those situations, uh, we are compelled to make mandatory reports. Uh, I also have within the Dropbox the link for the mandatory child abuse reporting video. Um, your agency might require that you watch it. And if that's the case, that's in there. Um, thinking about, I always want to take it really seriously when I have to um, violate confidentiality or I, or, or I have to go on one of these exceptions, right? Um, so if I'm suspecting child abuse, I want to really be suspecting it, not just like, you know, these, the statistics might indicate that child abuse might be happening in this home. I want more than that, right? I want, um, you know, if somebody is telling me that somebody is, is being abused, then that's, a, then I'm suspecting it, right? It wants, it, it, you want it to be really clear. Okay, um, the next one is about imminent harm or imminent threat. So if somebody says that they are a, uh, you know, a threat to themselves, either a threat for suicide or a threat for hurting, harming, or killing somebody else, um, Washington law has a permissive um, law. So it says that an advocate may break confidentiality to report an imminent threat. However, the federal guidelines are in conflict with that. It says, it says you can only do that if your state law says you have to, and ours doesn't say you have to, it just says you can. And so I err on the side always of confidentiality, um, but if you have a policy in your organization, follow your policy, follow what your um, organization uh, instructs you to do, but also know that the federal guidelines and the state guidelines are in conflict. We always want to practice informed consent, and this kind of goes with um, what Lucy's question is here in the chat. Um, I always will tell, um, because I'm trying to operate under um, the principles of trauma-informed care, uh, which are about safety and trust and choice and empowerment. And so I want to do as much as possible within those principles while also doing what my legal obligations are. And a lot of that is just about informed consent. So letting people know on the front end before, you know, when we're doing any kind of intake we're meeting people for the first time, we're letting them know what, we, what they can expect from us, what our role is, what the exceptions are to confidentiality. We're telling them that on the front end of working with them. Um, we're also talking about, you know, if, if, if the conversation feels like it's going there, that we're, that we're pausing to remind folks that, that they can make the best choice about whether or not they tell us understanding that we're mandatory reporters in particular areas, right? Um, and then if I have to make a report, um, I will tell somebody, you know, based on what you've told me, um, I'm obligated under my mandatory report, as I told you when we were, you know, first meeting that I had this, what you're telling me sounds like it, it falls under these guidelines and I'm going to have to make a report. Do you want to do it with me? I'll often offer that. Uh, if it's like a teenager uh, or uh, an adult who's talking about children within the home, um, they might be upset 
But generally speaking, I think people are the least upset the more you keep them informed. Um, and if they're like, no, I don't want anything to do with it. I'd be like, would you like me to wait until after you've left to make this report, you know? Um, or, you know, I just try to give them as many options as I can within the context of what I have to do. Uh, Cause I still want to keep at the forefront that they're have choice and what they can do, which is why I'm like, do you want to do this with me or do you want me to do it alone? Do you want me to tell you after I've done it? Like, how can I keep you as informed so that I am still trying to, I'm honoring my obligation while still trying to, to keep as much information as possible private for you and to keep trust within our relationship, uh, within our professional relationship, right? Sometimes it might be like, well, how, what are you going to tell them? Okay, well, here's what I have to tell them is these things, um, you know, because I, I don't want to give more information than about that particular suspected child abuse, right? They ask me for the address. That's something I have to give, but I don't have to tell them about the sexual assault that happened to you because you're an adult person, right? For example, but I do have to talk to them about what's happening with the children in the house. Uh, so I might kind of um, talk to them about what that will look like, and how much I'll have to tell them. Does that answer your question, Lucy, or did you have more that you wanted to kind of wanted to hear more about? No, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. And then the other um, two pieces where there are exceptions to confidentiality is one, if the survivor requests it, right? If I, the survivor says, uh, can you please release my you know, information to the advocate in Walla Walla because I'm, I'm moving over there, you know, or something like that. And so we'll talk about what a uh, release of information will need to look like at, what are we doing at? Making my slides. Talk about that in a second. And then the other piece is if there's a subpoena that come, is delivered to your organization. Again, the privilege belongs to the organization. It's the organization's responsibility to um, assert privilege, to work with the agency attorney, to assert privilege on your behalf as an advocate. Um, so uh, anytime that you get a subpoena, if it's related to your work, you wanna make sure and give it to the executive director as soon as possible so they know how to respond to it, right? So um, this happens on occasion. Um, I've gotten way more subpoenas than I've actually, than have actually had to have done anything. The court orders have to be signed by a judge. And a lot of times the subpoenas just come from attorneys and they're not signed. Um, and so those is us that's usually what we've gotten. And we've always been able to say, look, bring me something signed by a judge and then, and then, and then I'll call my attorney, but without anything signed, it doesn't really have any legal weight. But your executive director should know that you will have a policy within your organization on what to do with that. Um, and those steps that you need to take. And then we are here at WixApp uh, in case your executive director or board or anybody wants any additional information or advice on that. So. Hopefully, unless you're an executive director within this training, this will be above your pay grade. Okay, so we wanna, again, practice informed consent. So anytime that a survivor is like, I want to release my information, that we're talking with them so that the survivor can really understand, you know, the facts, the impacts, the future consequences. Because once I release something, out into the world, we don't know what happens to it, right? We can't ever really verify that it got somewhere, um, especially if we're using email. Um, my favorite way to release information at the request of a survivor is to give it directly to the survivor and say, you take it with you to your appointment so I don't have to fax something over or, I'm sorry, I've worked here for for several years and I haven't done direct services in a long time and we used to use fax machines and I know that's just not, probably not a thing anymore. <laughs> but um, the, uh, however it is that we're doing it, the best way to do it is to give it to the survivor and have them take it over. Like, you know, I can put it on my agency letterhead or 
I can verify, you know, through my signature that it comes from me or something like that, but to have them be the carrier. Uh, we want to make sure that they can understand any potential risks. Um, we want to make sure the survivor understands that it's voluntary, that it's not a condition of receiving services. A release of information um, will be a form that your agency has. Um, you have to have it. Um, and it needs to be time, time bound. So this release of information is um, valid until you know next Thursday. You put the date for what that is. You want to make it as short as possible. You don't want any. You don't want ever to have somebody sign a release of information that doesn't have a date. You also have to have a part of your form for release of information that has something at the bottom that says that they were taking back their release, that they take it back. No more, I changed my mind. We never want somebody to sign a blanket release of information uh, on the first day that they're meeting with us. We never want anything to seem like it's a condition of receiving our services. People do not need to release their information in order to get services. If you have a conversation about, you know, it could be really helpful for me to be able to talk to your caseworker over here at this other place where you're getting services so that we can work together collaboratively around this really specific thing that you've been talking about, right? Maybe it's your housing situation um, and it's your housing case manager that I need to talk to or that I think might be useful that we talk about that, have a conversation about that and what kind of things specifically I'm gonna to wanna to talk to that other person about and write that all down within the release of information and then we both sign it. And we say, this is only valid until next Thursday. We just try to be as specific as possible, right? And that the survivor understands where the information will go to whom and how it might be used, right? I'm releasing information to the housing case manager, the housing case manager might not have privilege. So they now have this piece of paper or this information that they might not be keeping confidential any longer. One of the things that's also important, especially within a legal case, um, if somebody is in a criminal justice case and they're releasing information to the prosecutors, all of that information becomes discoverable to the defense and therefore also usually the perpetrator or the offender in that case. Um, so we just want to be, if, if that's the case where we are in a, in a legal process, you know, it's, it's very probable that the person who assaulted you is going to see this. Does that still feel okay to release, right? We kind of want to explore some of those questions before, um, you know, just filling out the, the form and, and agreeing to release that information. Any questions on the exceptions or about informed consent and releases of information? What about if we're in a like like a small group conversation where that the victim has like wanted us to be there just as a support person and then like things come up when we're talking that maybe it would be relevant to share or something like that where it's not like on paper and it's not records? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what I would do if I'm in that kind of group setting, um, I'll just turn to the survivor and say, you know, is there anything that you want to add about this um, related to what we were talking about before? <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing, just to kind of get them, you know, to think about what it is that they might want to share. Um, I ask to take a break to ask them, you know, their permission to share information I think might be useful in that. Um, whenever I was in court with people, when I was a legal advocate, I would just keep a, a like paper between us and then I would write notes 
to the survivor when we were in court. Um, so sometimes I use that, you know, do you want me to share about this thing? Or sometimes I would just write, you know, don't forget to breathe or you're doing great or different things like that when I was within um, like working with survivors. So I think that that's a good strategy as well. Um, if you're going into a group setting though, <laughs> it's good just to have that conversation on the front end. <clears throat> when we're in here, is there different things that you want me to be able to say or advocate for you or, you know, to kind of come up with the guidelines that you're going to want to have beforehand. Um, you know, I would just say, I'm not going to share anything unless you want me to, but if something comes up um, that I think, you know, could be useful to share, you know, how do you want to handle that? You want to take a break? Um, you know, I just, just, set up the guidelines within the, with, with the survivor around the kind of, the kind of role they want you to play when you're, when you're there in that group setting. Thank you. Yeah. Patricia, are you ready to do some role play? I am, but I thought there was a couple of slides of annotating. Yep, we're gonna get, that's what I'm gonna go to. Yeah, but I am ready for role play whenever you're ready. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, you're right, it's later, later. I'm so sorry. Yes, we're gonna, you're right, Patricia, I'm sorry. Yes, we're gonna annotate. It's okay, you're just testing to see if I'm here paying attention. <laughs> okay, so select a, a stamp to annotate. We're gonna, Choose appropriate, not appropriate, or don't know. And if you cannot annotate, you are welcome to also put that in the chat. You have an answer. Okay, so we're gonna go through some scenarios regarding what you know about confidentiality. Indicate if the following scenarios are appropriate, not appropriate, or you don't know. Okay, make sense? Okay. Uh, let's here. After finishing a call on the crisis line, an advocate feels very upset and needs to talk about what happened to the survivor and how they handled the call as an advocate. They call their best friend and vent. Is this appropriate, not appropriate, or you don't know? Excellent, excellent. It is not appropriate. Anybody want to say why? You can put it in the chat or unmute yourself. If they needed to talk about it afterwards, they should probably be doing that with someone that they work with that would be related to the case and also have that confidential um, mindset. Right, exactly. A friend is not part of the organization, as Leticia said. And Liz also says friends are not advocates. That's right, they're not trained. They haven't consented to all this trauma work and you're gonna burn out all your friends, even if it wasn't you know, um, not allowed. They didn't give you consent to share their information with anybody. That's right. And, and also this with your agency, um, the place you're working or volunteering with, they probably have a plan in place for you, for people who need to debrief, right? And so um, it's important to know what that is and who you're supposed to connect with to debrief, because that is important. You shouldn't be mm -hmm. carrying that around. Yeah. Speaking to your supervisor, as Gracia said, like totally appropriate to talk to your supervisor. Um, one of the things that we did at my old agency was if you went out on a hospital call um, and you needed to debrief, um, actually our, our, our procedure was just so that you call the hotline after you're finished to at least let them know that you were done. And then that also gives you someone that you can debrief with as well 
who is, who's working, you know, somebody who's on the crisis line that we could talk to. So that was something that, that we did. That was a nice thing to do. So we'd call and be like, yep, yeah, I'm all done. Everything's fine. Like I'm going back to bed or, or we would talk with them say that was really hard. And Ugh, I feel terrible now. I feel achy. I don't know if I'm going to be able to sleep. You know. Yeah, Destiny, that's great. Allie, there needs to be boundaries. There's a lot of gray area for sure, for sure. Okay, let's clear this and then we'll do the next one. Um, what's your name, ja Jessica? Jessica? Your, I think it's your full name plus your uh, last name that's all together. So, but yes, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's go to the next one. Okay, when talking to a 14 year old, the advocate determines that the child has been abused. The child, the 14 year old, asks the advocate not to tell, determining that the report that to report the abuse would mean to break their confidence. The advocate decides not to report it. Is this appropriate, not appropriate, or don't know? Yeah, great. It's not appropriate. Why is that? The survivor the minor. We could be in danger. We're mandated reporters. We do not determine child abuse, but we have to report it if we have enough information to believe. Yes. Great. All right, let's try the next one. Okay, upon concluding support of a survivor during a detective interview, interview with a detective, the advocate is very tired, but cannot go to sleep. Feels they need to talk with someone. So they call their supervisor at the agency and talk about the interview. Is that appropriate, not appropriate, or don't know? Okay, appropriate. Why is that? Same organization, Leticia, thank you. Ah, Elizabeth asked a great question. Is the supervisor on call? That's a great question. I'm gonna say in this scenario, we will say yes. So let's just say for the sake of this scenario, the survivor, the supervisor is on call. And then yes, that is appropriate. Okay. 
Okay, yes, it's because they are at the same organization. And also, you know, they're trained, then the privilege belongs to the agency. But again, yes, be careful how much information you're talking about. If, if what you're trying to do is to debrief um, because you feel, you know, achy or triggered or, man, it was just really hard. It's just to talk about you, right? To focus on you. This person that I just was on a call with, uh, her scenario is so close to my mom's that I just can't shake it. And it's making me feel this really helpless and it's reminding me of her and all these things, right? Then we're talking about our experience instead of the callers. And that always helps me with my frame too. It's like, what's the purpose of me calling? Let's talk about me is to fix my stuff is to get support for me, not for the client. And then if it's about case management stuff, you probably don't have to call them in the middle of the night. You can make a note and, and talk to them in the morning and say, okay, here is all the stuff, the resources that I gave them. I'm wondering if that's right. right? Okay, we're gonna do one more. After a sentencing hearing, the victim and advocate leave the courtroom. On the way to the advocate's car, they see a friend of the advocate's in the parking lot. The friend is wondering why the advocate is there and asks that they have been involved in a case. The advocate tells the friend all about it since the case is over. Is this appropriate? Is this not appropriate? Or you don't know? Monica is just very sure with the exclamation point. Mm -hmm. So why is it not appropriate? Still doesn't matter, yep. Still confidential even if the case is over, right? We keep information confidential even after somebody has passed away unless it is released by the survivor, subpoenaed, or there is child abuse neglect. Great, great job everyone. Oh, it's time for a break again. Thank you, Cass. Yes. Okay, let's take a break again, and then we will finish up with some role play, a little bit more information about strengthening confidentiality. We'll be done for the day. Okay. Let's come back. I have 11 on six. Come back at 11, I don't know, 11.15. That's like not quite 10 minutes. Thank you. Anyone have any questions that came up while they were having a break or things they wanted to bring up before um, Patricia and I do a little role play for y'all? Okay, so we talked about what's okay to do, what's not okay to do, or what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. 
But Stacey and I are going to go through some scenarios um, about what that kind of looks like when you're the advocate, how you explain something, uh, and do a little role play uh, for like three scenarios. Um, okay. <laughs> Okay, you ready? Hi, I need some help uh, and I don't know where to start. I've never talked um, to anyone about this before. First of all, I'm really glad you're here. It's normal to not know where to start. Would it be helpful for me to talk a little bit about what you can expect from me as an advocate and what my role is before you get started? Yeah, that helps. As a sexual assault advocate, my job is to support you, listen to you, provide resources, and work in, collabor in collaboration with you and what you identify as your needs and what you want to happen. Washington State has laws to protect your privacy. What you tell me is confidential. That means I will respect your choice about who knows what, how much, and when. So anytime I need to share information or you ask me to share information, we will have a conversation about it. The only time I cannot guarantee that is if you tell me about specific instances of child abuse. I have to report that by law. Okay, so that's kind of an example of how we are explaining confidentiality to an adult. Any questions about that one before we move on and do another one? All right, we'll go on to the second role play. Mm -hmm. Can you send my file to my social worker? Uh, Patricia, yeah, your file is your information, and I'm happy to help you share it with whomever you see fit. Tell me about your goal for sharing it with your social worker. Well, I need them to know that I get services here uh, for my eligibility for a different program. Oh, okay. Well, why don't you and I, let's look at your file together, and we'll see what's in there. Based on what you see here, does it seem like something you'd like to share? Because once it leaves here, you won't have as much control over who sees it. If you think this is too much information, something I can do is like write a letter on our agency letterhead and sign it and we can put whatever information you want about your services. I can give you one copy or even several copies if you wanted to use that um, for any other services that you might be getting. And you can use it for whatever's helpful. So Patricia, which do you prefer? Um, yeah, I didn't know you could just write a letter to confirm I'm getting services through your agency. That would be better. Yeah, thank right. you. Yeah. Okay, a couple of questions here before we move on. Monica asked, what about suicidal ideation? You may have mentioned that before. You may have mentioned that earlier, but I don't remember. Yes, I did. Um, suicidal, it's, if, if someone's a threat, has made threats to harm themselves or someone else, uh, suicide ideation is super common. And we're going to talk more about that in session five. Um, but as far as your reporting requirements in our state law is permissive, but the federal guidelines are pretty clear that if, unless the state law says you have to, that you can't. Uh, report that if somebody has threats to harm themselves or someone else. However, talk to your supervisor, look at your policies. You all might have policies about that. Um, you might, your, your agency might have said, you know what, the liability for this is higher than the liability for confidentiality. And they may have made that decision. Um, but in this scenario that we're doing here, that is not a requirement. That makes sense, Monica. And then, man, 
Nancy asks, can a sexual assault advocate be subpoenaed to testify in court? And if there is a distinction between being subpoenaed and actually testifying. Anytime that anyone is subpoenaed at an organization, that subpoena is, needs to be represented by the agency. So the agency needs to take steps to assert privilege and work with the agency attorney to assert that privilege, right? So um, if I'm the executive director at an agency, I'm going to work with my attorney to say, to you know, have a communication with the court that says, uh, we're asserting privilege in this case, um, you know, and, and don't want to subpoena or don't want to, you know, comply with the subpoena. And then we work with them to see if it's like, you know, we really are going to want you to do it anyway. And then we'll get a court order and then we'll have to do it. But um, anytime that I've gotten a subpoena, it's always good just to tell the client that you're working with that you've gotten one because they might be like, yeah, I will really do want you to share that information. And be like, okay, well, we don't have to have a subpoena for that. We can just give you the information and you can share it with your attorney who is subpoenaing us, right? There's sometimes an easier way to, to go about doing that. Uh, sometimes a client might say, oh, I, I don't, you don't have to assert privilege on my behalf. I want them to have this information. But I always want to keep a client informed about what's happening. <clears throat> I have never uh, had to testify. Um, I don't know any advocates who have ever had to testify uh, because of the subpoena. Um, a couple of times, our executive director went to testify on behalf of the agency in the case of subpoenas. It was very, very rare, I would say. Does that answer your question, Nancy? Usually they're just subpoenaing records. Is the state law is, is the revised code of Washington that provides for the um, provides for advocate privilege. That is on the slide seven. And the RCW is 5.60.060. And then in parentheses seven. So like the section seven of that law. Anything else, Nancy, regarding your question? No, thank you. That's it. I was just um, just curious. I had heard that advocates don't have to testify. So I was yeah. curious as to if, you know, the state law lined up with that specifically, you know, that specifically or not. Uh, it makes sense that the agency would be the ones to be representative. Right, right. Yeah. It's the agency that kind of holds the privilege more than the individual person. So... Can you explain a little bit more about um, that? Uh, what did you describe it as? Uh, asserting privilege? Mm -hmm. Where that language comes from? Mm -hmm. So in this RCW, uh, the a sexual assault advocate, it says a sexual assault advocate may not without the consent of the victim be examined as to any communication made between the victim and the sexual assault advocate. That's the language that's in there. And it defines sexual assault advocate as an employee or volunteer from a community sexual assault program or underserved populations provider, victim assistance unit, program, or association that provides medical or legal advocacy, counseling, or support to victims of sexual assault, who is designated by the victim to accompany the victim to a hospital or other healthcare facility, and to proceedings concerning the alleged assault, including police prosecution interviews and court proceedings. And then it says that a sexual assault advocate can dis may disclose a confidential communication without the consent of the victim if failure to disclose is likely to result in clear imminent risk of serious physical injury or death. See the may there, that's the permissive one. 
Any sexual assault advocate participating in good faith in disclosing of records and communications under this section shall have civil or criminal or shall have immunity from any liability. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's do this last one here. Sure. <clears throat> All right. Um, there's this guy at school and he's real messed up and I want to tell someone about it. Yeah, you can talk to me about it. Can I though real quick before you do, just tell you about what you can expect from me? Sure. So Washington State has laws to protect people under 18 from abuse. And so many adults like me have to report it if you tell me about someone under 18 who has been harmed or is in danger of harm. But anytime that I think I might need to share information uh, or report something, we're going to have a conversation about it, okay? All right. Okay. So these are just different ways that I would explain mandatory reporting to somebody who is a minor how we would explain informed consent or kind of talk about informed consent with the client and how we would explain confidentiality to an adult. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth has, oh, go has ahead. Yeah. Saw it too. yeah, go ahead, Elizabeth. <clears throat> oh, um, I was gonna ask something that's not related to this role play where you're doing some- That's okay. Oh, okay. Um, in the last or the initial introductory training um, last month, someone asked about a specific scenario, like if you're working the hotline and a caller calls and they're in a real time situation where, you know, they're being threatened by a significant other um, you know, live on the call with you. And if there was confusion, and so I was wondering if maybe you could address that, like a sp that specific scenario and uh, what you would be forced or, you know, required or responsible to report versus not, or would you, you know, tell them you need to uh, call 911 or like, how would you handle that? The advocates said it was really rare, but. <laughs> yeah, so I'm guessing you're talking about a training you took with the Washington Coalition, the Washington yeah. State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Yeah. So uh, that's different um, because it's domestic violence and I can't really speak to that specifically. Okay. I will also say though, it is super rare. And I always think it's best if people call 911 themselves. I Because I would have to get a bunch of information for somebody to hang up and call 911. What good is that gonna do? Especially if there's like, you know, something's going on. I'm gonna call the police and be like, I was talking to somebody and I don't have their number. And I don't know who they are, but like there was like, it sounded like there was violence. Like what are they gonna do with that information, right? So I always, you know, try to say like, if I'm on the phone with somebody and be like, it sounds like you're in danger right now. Um, I think you need to hang up <clears throat> and call 911 if you feel like you're in danger. I can't help you with this because I don't know anything about you. I can't send for help unless you give me information. And then we have to like spend all this time getting that information from them to be able to then call 911 and do that, right? So that's that's always what I would do, regardless of what, you know, whether or not you have to report it or not, it's like, do you even have enough information to do that? And it's best always if they do it themselves. So let's talk a little bit more about mandatory reporting. And this is about just anything we have to report, right? Not just, mostly I'm gonna talk about child abuse, but, but say for example, we are, looking at imminent harm as well, that a lot of these guidelines can be really useful for that as well. So we wanna take a best practice approach to um, mandatory reporting. 
And that means that we are practicing transparency and honesty, like I was doing with Patricio when we did that role play. We're saying, here's what your rights are, here's what could happen. Um, that I always say, anytime I'm gonna have to make a report, uh, we're gonna have a conversation about it first. So that I can say, here's what you can expect. Here's what it's like when we make, when we make a call. Do you wanna be involved? Um, we can make the call on speakerphone. Do you want to be gone when I do this? Because maybe they're, you know, maybe they're a runaway, right? Maybe they don't want to be, and they don't have a place to live. And so, you know, they want to get out of there. So they're not, so like they don't get picked up or something. Um, I'll give them that option. All I have to do is report the, the abuse, I don't have to like, you know, keep them there or anything. That's not our role, right? Um, we also don't have to uh, report any runaway uh, status. Some youth serving organizations have to do those calls, but as sexual assault advocates, our privilege protects us from having to, to do those kind of runaway reports. It's just abuse or neglect. Um, so just having a lot of transparency, a lot of honesty, not feeling like I'm hiding anything from anybody, um, that's gonna help build and foster trust. And people might get mad at me um, and that's okay. Um, I can validate that, you know, I know you're angry and this law might not be super helpful in your circumstance. And, you know, I have to do this or I could lose my job or be you know, in trouble. So this is a thing that I have to do. And I also wanna make sure that you're protected. And so that's another reason why I'm doing it. And let's talk about how to like make this so it's gonna be, you know, least impact you and you can be the most informed about what's happening. Right. So the transparency and honesty piece uh, is just so crucial when we're working, especially with teenagers, um, when we're working with parents who are really afraid of CPS um, because of whatever reason, right? We all have experiences with systems related to our culture, our identities, what we hear from people in our communities about you know, whether or not CPS or law enforcement or different things are helpful or unhelpful, if they're a route for you or not. And so we wanna be really just transparent and honest with people, especially when they're like, I don't trust them. They're gonna take my kids away. You know, it's that gonna be that kind of thing. That's the conversation we want to, you know, help them be as involved as possible so that they have some control over that. Um, the other part, is about kind of checking our biases and triaging with somebody else. I always think that this is really important anytime I'm gonna to have to make a mandatory report. You don't have to do it right away. You don't have to hang up the phone and you know call 911 and report a, a child abuse report. You call the reporting hotline that does child protective services work, right? Uh, and you have some time to do that. I always think it's good for us to um, just kind of talk with somebody else within our agency um, about whether or not it's a reportable thing, especially as we're new. So they were talking about this and there was like, um, for example, I had a call from an advocate when I was working here at WICSAP um, that was like, I really want to make a child abuse report, but I don't know if it's reportable. And I was like, okay, well, why don't you tell me about it? And then we can try to figure that out. Uh, like her supervisor wasn't available. So I was talking to her, which is fine. You can, and you, you can always call us. Um, and she was like, the, the animal abuse is so bad that they were talking about within this home. And I'm feeling like, just like, I have to make a report. And I was like, okay, well, but that's not child abuse and that's not a mandatory report. And she was like, I know, but it's like, it just, it makes me sick to my stomach. I can't believe this is happening, you know? And so we talked about how it's hard to hear a lot of stuff about animal abuse and how it's not, it, how it, how also it is not a mandatory report um, and kind of talk through some of those things, right? Um, because we have, we're, we're the ones who take the call. We hear a lot of the details. Sometimes we're in crisis and we want to do something about it. So sometimes it's always good to check in with 
a colleague, a coworker to be like, is this reportable? And for somebody else to say yes or no, or I don't know, let's talk about it more. This also helps us check our bias, right? Like if we are getting those calls and we're a vegan, we're an ASPCA supporter, you know, that we might be really like, oh, this is a bias that I have around this, right? Um, or uh, we have thoughts, our own thoughts about what is okay as far as parenting or as far as discipline or what neglect means, right? Like we might never leave our kids home alone um, without an adult there or an older child to babysit. And somebody else might be needing to because they are working several jobs and the last daycare provider was like really harmful, right? We don't know the scenarios about what are ha what's happening. So it's always good for us to have this conversation, especially when it comes to neglect. We can have a lot of kind of biases about like, well, okay, let's talk through this and think like, what kind of danger does this put the child in right now? You know, we're kind of exploring whether or not it's, it's abuse or neglect. We go and we look up the standards again, or we rewatch the video, or we look at the manual for child abuse reporting. It's like, okay, is this a thing? So we're just slowing down and taking a look because confidentiality is incredibly important. And we want to be really sure when we're going to have to um, have to make an exception to it, right? So we just want to check in with other people. So checking our biases, talking with other people, and then being really transparent and honest is our best practice approach for doing um, mandatory reporting. Any questions about that? Really briefly, I want to talk about some of the differences between systems-based advocacy and community-based advocacy. So if you're in this training, most likely you are a community-based advocate and you have to do this training um, because you get some kind of Office of Crime Victims Advocacy funding, you work in an accredited sexual assault program. Most of those people will be community-based advocates. And privilege uh, protects community-based advocates. But there is some case law that makes this really difficult for systems-based advocates. And what that means is an advocate that works at a prosecutor's office or works at a law enforcement agency, right? So again, your privilege is connected to your employer. And if your employer is the... Um, is the you know, Olympia Police Department or your employer is the Thurston County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, then you have different, you have different uh, confidentiality that you're able to keep, right? Because everything that goes to the prosecutor is discoverable to the defense, they can't really keep information confidential. So uh, it's really about where somebody works and if privilege is intact. Um, so the case law is um, Brady versus Maryland. That's where this information comes from. If anybody wanted to look it up or look more into it, but this is kind of where we get the information that prosecuting attorney's offices and law enforcement agencies that have advocates don't have the same confidentiality as community-based advocates. And so that's just a really important thing for survivors that we're working with to know, because sometimes they'll have both. Um, because systems-based advocates that work with the prosecuting attorney's offices can be super useful, right? They can look up your case, they can see where it's at, they can see what's going on with it. They have access to different kinds of resources. Um, you know, like if somebody, if they needed to get, folks need to get like their mileage reimbursed because they have to keep going to court prosecuting attorney's office has funding for that and they might be able to help, the advocate might be able to help you get that kind of stuff. Like, but a community-based advocate is the only one that has the actual privilege and the, and the confidentiality requirement. Systems advocates are gonna try to keep your information private and not share it, but that doesn't have the privilege that can be asserted.
Treasury say do you want to talk about strengthening confidentiality? Sorry, I was muted. Strengthening confidentiality. What happens when you live in a small town? Everyone knows everyone. <clears throat> you are from a small cultural community. You know your client from another setting. Born and raised in Toppenish, like I mentioned on the Yakima Reservation. Boy, can I relate to this. Um, it's challenging when you have clients who don't trust advocates because they know them from um, their faith groups, school, or other community um, agencies or gathering places. The client should have the option to work with another advocate who they feel more comfortable with. I um, started into Sexual Assault Crisis Line Advocacy Hospital um, um, Advocacy when in Seattle, big city. I was there, I didn't know anybody, not a problem. And then fast forward to 2008, I'm back home um, in Yakima County working a day job and volunteering as a sexual assault advocate for the local community sexual assault program in Yakima. And I'm working with English language learners in a middle school. Last day of school happens. I'm on call for the crisis line for that evening. And I get a call to report to the hospital. And I go there and I enter the room and it's one of the students that I worked with at the school um, for my day job. I was shocked and you just, you know, it's like split second, what do I do? Oh my God, it's with her parents. And I just, you know, sh she saw me and she just covered her face. And what wants to come out of my, my mouth as a mother, as a grandmother is, it's okay, but it's not okay. It is not okay. But that's, you know, what I wanna say instinctually. And um, so I just let them know that this was, um, I'm an advocate, a volunteer advocate with the local sexual assault agency. If you want a different advocate here, we could do that. This is what I do really just remaining calm and I don't I don't even know how I was breathing at the time because it was um, a really tough situation for me but that those are the kinds of things that can happen right um, they did decide that they did want me to stay and support them while they were at the hospital um, but that's just one example and we want to think about what gives the survivor the most control over their information, right? Options, always options. I don't have to be the advocate that is here with you. One of the other advocates uh, can come and, be, and support you through this. Um, giving them time to think about it and um, yeah. Small communities. There are many rural and other, um, you know, just other scenarios. Um, as communities of a certain culture, we gather together, we do things together, and these things might have might come up. It's possible. It's it's real. Does anybody else have any uh, experience that they would? Yes, Ali, a different advocate. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you for your comment. I'm going to read the whole thing. Ali states, you can always refer to a different advocate if the client doesn't feel comfortable talking to the advocate they may personally know. Some are different. They may like it because they 
may feel more comfortable since there's already a relationship built right there, especially in the deaf community. A lot of people know each other, so it's important for us to give them the space and platform to share their story to an advocate, always ensuring their own agency, their own power at that moment. It's very, very, very important and something to think about. Michelle, do you want to add anything to, to this? No, I think Allie gives just a great, you know, example. The, there are so many of our communities that are just so small like that. And so sometimes it's like, yes, I do want to work with you because you are from my community. It's like, or the total opposite. You never really know what yes. it's going to be. And yeah, and giving them that space. I was shocked. She was shocked. I was shocked to see her. She was shocked to see me. And she needed space to think about it. Melissa, go ahead. Okay. I remember on my first day I asked, I said, you know, we're from a small community. Um, what if like, you know, one of my friends came in? I I I don't want to be their advocate. <laughs> and then they laughed and they said, no, that that happens. That happens often. And they said, and it's not in a good way often, but if that does, you can sit with them if they want you to for support, but we'll have another advocate to be their advocate. And so that was really nice to hear that, you know, that um, that was an option. Cause like, if that makes sense, but yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Any other comments? This came up for me so much when I was doing legal advocacy because I was sitting in court all the time. And so I would see other people, they weren't my clients, but I would see other people that I knew just from sitting in court all day with other people. Um, and so that was something else that I had to, to, to really navigate to is just running into people, hearing their, you know, people's, just all the different court cases that are happening, you know, in a protection order hearing or you just, because a lot of it's just like waiting around through other cases. And so you see other people you know from the community. I believe we're ready to go on to the next slide. Okay, just a couple more and then we'll be done for the day. Thank you, everyone. Remember, so, if you have any, any questions, you can hang back. Yeah, and, uh, of course. So these just a couple of just kind of additional things that just don't really go with any particular session. So um, I throw them in the end here to talk about kind of what the service standards are within Washington State. Um, every county has a community sexual assault program. Uh, some of the, you know, like for Grant and Adams County, it's the same one. They serve both counties, but every county has one that's, that is um, assigned to them. And they all provide the same services um, that kind of just look or are structured slightly differently. They all are accredited through Washington State uh, Community Sexual Assault Programs. And um, they're credited so that there is some ability for survivors in Walla Walla, San Juan Islands, Whatcom County, Ponderay County, for them to all be able to have the same general services with some other additional differences, right? So at all of those programs, you can get information and referral. You can get crisis intervention general advocacy, legal advocacy, medical advocacy, and then systems advocacy. And I'm gonna talk in a second about what systems advocacy are, is. And then in some other organizations outside of these general service standards, there might be things like support group, there might be therapy, there might be housing services, there might be a lot of other things. But these main ones uh, are, are what is guaranteed every county has for sexual assault survivors. 
um, and are all funded by Office of Crime Victims Advocacy or OCVA services. Systems advocacy is when we uh, are working with other systems within our communities. And that's part of our role as advocates and as sexual assault programs, because engaging with systems can be super re-traumatizing for survivors. Systems advocacy is giving clients information about what those systems are like, letting them know about their client rights, helping them understand the needs, helping um, the systems understand the needs of survivors. And if there's gaps that we're seeing or themes that we work with those systems to try to make them better for survivors. So they can be a single instance or a coordinated effort at the organizational level. In some places, you know, the law enforcement agency might be really problematic. And in some places it might be really um, great. In some places, the hospital might be just a hot mess and a lot of things that you have to work with. And in another place, it might be, you know, um, really, you know, great and streamlined and they've got their sexual assault um, response down, you know, and so in each community, what our systems advocacy is going to look like is really based on what the experiences we see from survivors are and how as an organization we start to work with these systems, create memorandums of understanding, create agreements for us to refer, um, different things like that so that everything's working better for survivors. That's our main goal um, as sexual assault programs. So this can be in a single instance or that coordinated effort um, over time. And that we manage conflict between our systems so that it doesn't hurt survivors. Um, and again, your role is so important, like we said on the first session on Monday, that um, because it's different than everyone else's survivor might be encountering, right? Which is people are trying to find out what happened to them and we are not trying to do that. So we can have a really clear um, way of helping survivors work through some of these systems. Michelle, can I add an example here? Please do, yeah. So um, we work with, community sexual assault programs and other agencies throughout Washington state. And something that we really, you know, see is how they're working with the systems, right, that are in place, especially when it's child advocacy. And so as Michelle mentioned before, the list of what CSAPs have, one of them is uh, child advocate, uh, advocate. And so um, in working with police, detectives, child protective services. There's, there could be so many people you're working with if you're an advocate for a child um, sexual assault survivor. And it's really, really an amazing um, role to be in, as Michelle has highlighted at the bottom, because um, your role is different than everyone else in that family's situation. So let's say the um, detective wants to, uh, needs to, needs to do an interview. And so the role of the child advocate would be to prepare that young person for this, not to go in cold, not to meet them, the advocate right before, but to work on that relationship and maybe possibly go to the place where they're gonna be interviewed so they can be as comfortable as possible. It's um, a real collaboration. And I've heard of it not being so collaborative. And so our goal is we really are the voice for that family. And the other agency systems need to listen. Thanks, Michelle. You bet. Okay, we are done with content for today. So I'm gonna stop the recording.